Welcome. So we're gonna we're gonna be doing uh, separate love and separation, and I have an article which I want to read and discuss. So this is the second. This is gonna be the second in the series love and separation, and probably it will be useful to speak about separation from guru also. Probably more useful, but. In any case, we'll start reading the article and uh, discussing it. Is that okay with everybody? Love and Separation, Part 2. Welcome to Live Ustream. We're on Ustream Live from Crawley. Crawley, England. Funny name, isn't it? Sounds like people crawl here. <laughs> Do they? Well, this lighting is really good. I could make a lot of videos today with this. Just sit here and the background's not so good. Well, I mean, it's meh, it's okay. You know, it's not ideal. But it's got Lord Jagannath and Prabhupada. And, yeah, okay. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, we can work on it later. We can just sit here all day and give two videos. I have to make some videos. So, let's read a little bit, and then we'll have some discussion and um, see if we can bring this into the topic of separation from Guru, which we did talk about a little bit, but we could. I don't think you can ever talk about that too much because it's so, it's just difficult to fully appreciate. So, we may read or hear some gurus say that Vrindavan Dham is the land of Samboga, which means meeting. Devotees might think this is at odds with what Prabhupada taught us in Krishna book and Srimad Bhagavatam which means separation. Separation is higher than meeting. So Vrindavan is the land of meeting. So does separation occur in Vrindavan? Have we ever considered why Mahaprabhu exhibited his most elevated ecstatic emotions, not in Navadweep or Vrindavan, but in Jagannath Puri? Have you ever considered that? Is that what you think about all day? If you don't think about these things, this is what you should be thinking about. Vrindavan is a land of meeting. Does separation exist in Vrindavan? And why is Puri called the place of separation? You should be thinking about this. You should be dreaming about this. Right? <laughs> One answer is that Jagannath Puri is also referred to as Vipralamba Chetra. Pralamba means separation. The feelings of separation experienced by Lord Chaitanya in the mood of Radharani are replicas of those same feelings of separation that occurred in Vrindavan even now, that occur in Vrindavan even now. The Lord's highest ecstasies were exhibited as, quote, his body was at Jagannath Puri, but his mind was in Vrindavan. So he's trying to make the point that in Vrindavan they do feel separation, even though Puri is where Mahaprabhu went to feel separation. Krishna book in the tenth canto tell that these same highest ecstasies of feelings of separation were experienced by Radharani and the gopis in Vrindavan. So how can Vrindavan be a place of eternal meeting with the Lord? Did Prabhupada ever teach us that meeting is the highest thing? So he's making the premise that said, Vrindavan's a place of meeting. Puri is a place of separation. If we think about it, each time we attend a Rathyatra event, we are participating in a Vipralamba experience. The meditation is to bring Krishna, Jagannath, back to Vrindavan to meet with Radharani and the gopis. But Rathyatra is a joyful occasion. There is something meaningful in this desire to unite Krishna with Radharani, Samboga. So, 
Some say separation is the highest. Prabhupada said separation is the highest, and Rathayatra is to bring them together. So if separation is the highest, maybe we should turn the cart around and go the other way and separate them. But we don't. We bring them together, bring them back to Vrindavan. And uh, this is from Chaitanya Charitamrita. Now, this is from the teachings of Lord Chaitanya. It is very difficult to express the Manjari's dealings with Krishna because they have no desire to mix with Krishna or enjoy him personally. They are always ready to help Radharani associate with Krishna. Their affection for Krishna and Radha is so pure, they are simply satisfied when Radha and Krishna are together. Indeed, their transcendental pleasure is in seeing Radha and Krishna united. The actual form of Radha is like a creeper embracing the tree of Krishna. Good morning or afternoon <laughs> or almost afternoon. Even though the gopis want Radha and Krishna to unite and we share in their mood, are we opposing the usual truism that vipralamba is meant for the highest attainment? So saying, you want to bring Radha and Krishna together, but we say separation is higher. So why are we trying to bring them together if separation is higher? And the gopis are always helping Radha and Krishna come together. That's what they do. It's the main thing they do. The subject of Samboga and Vipralamba can be understood in a basic way. Otherwise, it expands into an ad infinitum of the ocean of Bhakti Ras. So here's the explanation, and it's, I think it's common sense. Samboga, which is meeting, and Vipralamba, which is separation, can be best understood in proper context if we apply whether these events take place in a manifest on earth or unmanifested in the spiritual world. With manifest and unmanifest, we can determine Prabhupada's true stance. Um, what is the highest attainment of bhakti? There's a quote. Sri Krishna's pastimes in this material world are called prakataliva, manifest, and his pastimes in the spiritual world are called aprakata, unmanifest. By unmanifest, we mean they're not present before our eyes. It is not that Krishna's pastimes are not manifest. They're going on just as the sun is going on perpetually. But when the sun is present before our eyes, we call it daytime. And when it is not present, we call it nighttime. Those who are above the jurisdiction of night are always in the spiritual world, where the Lord's pastimes are constantly manifest. There were times when Prabhupada did say Samboga meeting was the perfection. In a letter he wrote, Don't feel yourself to be alone because Krishna is always with you. Krishna is always with everyone. And to his devotee, he talks and gives instruction how to attain the perfectional stage of meeting him. So don't feel alone. The perfectional stage of meeting him refers to Samboga. Are we to take this in isolation and declare that Prabhupada says Samboga is the highest thing? We can say yes to this if we balance it with what he commonly says, and in what context? For example, quote, it's from the Chaitanya Charitamrita. Krishna has two kinds of presence, prakata and aprakata, manifest and unmanifest. These are, our, these are identical for the sincere devotee. If Krishna is not physically present, the devotee's constant absorption in the affairs of Krishna makes him always present. This is like the ultimate contradiction between presence and separation, is if you if you're separated, you think of Krishna, and if you think of Krishna, the thinking, because he's absolute, is the same as meeting, so you actually can never be separated. It's not actually transcendentally, physically possible to be separated from Krishna if you're actually experiencing separation, because you'll be thinking of him. And you're going to apply that to the spiritual master also. Because the service of the spiritual master... And the words of the spiritual master put you in the presence of the spiritual master because of the absolute nature of the transcendental realm. So you can never really be separated. And the more you feel separated, the more you think and, and the more you feel the presence. 
So the more you're separated, the more you feel the presence. It's like a transcendental paradox. Hmm. Another common example, Prabhupada says, so Samboga and Vipralamba, there are two stages of meeting Krishna. Samboga means when he's present, this is called, yeah, Samboga. Personally talking, meeting, embracing. And there's another, Vipralamba, the two ways a devotee can be benefited. So there's two ways of meeting. Separation is a way of meeting. That's interesting, right? We're meeting in separation. Hmm. Here Prabhupada says, both Prakat, prakat and Aprakat, Samboga and Vipralamba are two stages of meeting Krishna and are identical. How does separation cause a meeting with Krishna? Prabhupada writes, those under the shelter of the lotus feet of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu can understand that his mode of worship of the Supreme Lord in separation is the real worship of the Lord. When the feelings of separation become very intense, one attains the stage of meeting Krishna. You see, you actually see him in separation. Isn't it? Sometimes pure devotees speak of seeing or meeting Krishna wherever they look or wherever they go, when under the influence of intense separation. Whereas in Samboga, they will see or meet a single form of Krishna. They just see Krishna in front of them when they're with him. But when they're not with him, every, everything reminds them of Krishna. So they're seeing Krishna everywhere. You know, if you lose something dear to you, then that's what you think about. And everywhere you go, you think about it. You ever had that experience? Lost something really important, and you can't stop thinking about it. You're thinking about it much more because you've lost it than you would if you had it. Sometimes pure devotees speak of seeing or meeting Krishna when they look or wherever they go, when under the influence of intense vipralamba. Whereas in Samboga, they will see or meet a single form of Krishna. Prabhupada consistently advocated meeting or Samboga through Vipralamba. So how do we understand how Vipralamba takes place in Vrindavan if that is the place of Samboga, as some say? Really, it is not what some say, but what all enlightened Vaishnavas say. And we have to revert to Prakat, manifest pastimes on earthly Vrindavan, and Aprakat, unmanifest pastimes in hidden Vrindavan. For example, each time Prabhupada said that Krishna never takes one step outside of Vrindavan, and we all repeat that often, he means that Krishna never ever leaves Aprakat or hidden Vrindavan. He forever remains there with his loving devotees in Samboga. Because Krishna never leaves Vrindavan. You know that song? Because Krishna never leaves Vrindavan. You don't see the Leela, but they see it in their heart, right? You want me to read that again? See, the Prabhupada said, Krishna never ever takes one step out of Vrindavan. He means that Krishna never leaves the unmanifest pastime of Vrindavan, unmanifest Vrindavan. He remains there with his loving devotees in Samboga. In Samboga, in meeting, then where does separation fit in that Krishna book and Bhagavatam so elaborately described to us? The answer is all these affairs of separation as described in the Krishna book and Srimad Bhagavatam occur in manifest Vrindavan for earthly vision. They do not take place in Aprakat Vrindavan. Another feature of Prakat Leela is that it is further training for devotees before they enter Aprakat. So in the eternal pastimes of Krishna, there's no separation. And in the manifest pastimes, there is. For the eternally liberated soul, there's no separation. 
After giving up the body, the devotee who becomes perfect in devotional service enters that particular universe where Lord Ramachandra or Lord Krishna is engaged in his pastimes. Then after being trained to serve the Lord in various capacities in that Prakat Leela, the devotee is finally promoted to Sanatan Dham, the supreme abode in the spiritual world. So you all know that, right? Being promoted to, you go to Krishna Leela and then to the spiritual world. Being promoted to Sanatan Dham means promoted to the Aprakat Leela, the eternal Leela. So this is what Bhaktivinoda Thakur says. I hope you're following all this. We'll discuss it in a while. This is interesting discussion. There are two types of Krishna Leela, manifest and unmanifest. Separation Separation happens in the manifest Leela. In the unmanifest Leela, there's no separation of the Vrajadevis, the gopis, from Krishna, who is eternally engaged in his Leelas. It is written in the Mathura Mahatma. Krishna plays eternally with the gopis and gopas there. Since the verb krid, which means play, is the present tense, it's to be understood that Krishna's Leelas are eternal. In the uppercut Leela of Goloka, or Vrindavan, there is no separation caused by Krishna's making his residence in a distant place. Love and union exist eternally there. So in the spiritual world, love and union, no separation. This evidence synchronizes perfectly with Prabhupada's teaching. He said, I'm not manufacturing, we cannot manufacture. But we repeat what Bhaktivinoda Thakur says. For us, Vipralamba has special significance because somehow we have to feel being separated from the Lord. Pure devotees cannot bear a single moment without the Lord. If we can bear minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, years, and lifetimes without the Lord, then this Viraha or Vipralamba process is for us. Whoa. Wow, you're late. You solved all their problems? Uh, I don't know. You're working on it? Yeah. This respect... Oh, wait, hold on a second. Yes. So? My keyboard. Oh, no. Should we, why don't we leave it here? You can pick it. Oh, you're not coming back here. Oh, are you leaving the machine here? Are you leaving anything here for me to pick up? I don't know. Oh, okay. Okay, we'll just leave I may here. not leave anything, but why don't we leave it here and then someday you'll come back for it. Okay, you can come back to Friday, so it's fine. If you wanna just in case I get inspired. It's my last Okay, that's fine. Maybe I'll sing a song for everybody, you know. <laughs> when we end class. All right. Here, come here and say hello to everybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Jenny's too shy. She's leaving now. Say hello, Hari Bong. <laughs> now you're going to be eternally you're eternally on Ustream now. <laughs> oh no! Don't worry, you're not the body, so you don't have to. You don't have to worry. <laughs> Thank you so Jen, much. you're welcome. Um, can you check in online for Guru Maharaj? Like if you yeah. see this show in your email, and then just I'm interested in checking online because I'm recording by. Maya should be coming. He said he was coming. Hold on. Business as usual. Can you get me the number for the suitcase people? It's in my book. Here's here's the ticket. Haribo. Jai. Goranga. I have to do business during class. Here's this. It's... it's the number on the bottom, it's not that number. Some other number. Lost my suitcase. This is what happened. It wouldn't fit on the plane to carry on, and they said, we'll just check it below. And I got into London, it wasn't there, and we called and we found out. It's, as of yesterday, it was still in Florence. It was supposed to be on the last night's flight. So, 
I'm feeling separation from my suitcase. It has a few things in it I need. I'm always thinking about it. Mm. For us, separation has special significance because somehow we have to feel being separated from the Lord. Pure devotees cannot bear a moment. If we can bear minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, years, and lifetimes without the Lord, then separation, the separation process is for us. Separation, seva, is our highest ideal for this life in devotion and for the next life of devotion, prakat lila, if we are fortunate. So separation, enhan- feeling, feeling separation enhances our bhakti and for when we're in the material world, we have the opportunity to experience separation because it appears that Krishna is separ- we're separated from him. And that intensifies the emotion. So it's, it's a process to intensify emotion. It's an aspect of love. Which you see exhibited in the pastimes of, of Radha and Krishna all the time because Radha and Krishna are basically they're separated most of the day. And then meeting is not always easy. And that increases their, the harder it is for them to meet, the more it increases their infection. So if you look at Krishna Leela, especially with, with the gopis, there's a lot of Leelas where it's very hard for Radha and Krishna to meet. Or Radharani, as we discussed previously, will feel that Krishna is separated from her. Or even when she's present there, it increases, this intense feeling increases. You know, as you think if you're going to lose something very dear, it just it intensifies whatever emotion you have for it. So the idea is that separation increases emotion. Then if you, um, if you ask any disciples of Prabhupada how, how their relationship has developed with, with Prabhupada, and they'll say that it's, it's developed in ways in separation it could never develop in presence. And there's a uh, closeness, uh, depth of meditation, and intensity of feeling that is unique to the separation process. So we shouldn't look at separation as something that we abhor, that we run away from, that, but we can look at it as something which can nourish and intensify affection. Of course, as we said last time, that we should want the presence, we should seek out the presence of the Guru. But at the same time, we shouldn't automatically think that just because we're physically in their presence, we're actually in their presence. Because serving their order is, is it's actually how you associate. It's not a physical thing. Of course, being physically present, <clears throat> you experience the transcendental nature of their association. That's for sure. But oftentimes, Prabhupada would say the real association is through the instruction. And that's where you feel the presence and the help of your spiritual master and Srila Prabhupada the most is in the instruction. That's where you feel the most affection. And then just hearing the instruction, you feel that affection because the instruction is good for you. And then in executing that instruction, (coughs) excuse me, (coughs) in executing that instruction, you really feel the presence. There's some, this equates a bit, somewhat materially. Because even you wouldn't throw darts at a picture of a loved one even though it's just a picture. So you, you feel their presence somewhat in their picture, in, in the items they used, you wouldn't just throw them away, you would, they would remind you of them. It's, it's like part of them is there in their items. So you hold on to those items. And it increases, it often increases your affection now, the interesting thing is that materially speaking, if we've lost someone, we have great affection for them. If it's a material relationship, it hurts. But if it's a spiritual relationship, it hurts. But it doesn't hurt in the same way because 
that spiritual personality is, is so much alive and present in their remembrance that you have this like transcendental paradox where you can be hurting, but at the same time you're blissful. It's, I know it's, it's, it's awkward, but if you, if you think about Krishna consciousness and you think about any times that you've struggled with difficulties, whatever those difficulties may be, there's, there's always this underlying blissfulness of Krishna consciousness, which always remains no matter what difficulties we go through. So the kind of separation we may experience between ourselves and another devotee may have pain, but it also has bliss. And, and sometimes separation is, is, the analogy is that it's, that's like hot chutney, or it's burning inside and very sweet outside. So there's, in Krishna consciousness, there's always sweetness, right? It's, it, no matter how bad it gets, it's always, there's an, always a sweetness of Krishna consciousness that runs through whatever difficulties we're going through. So you can be separated from a devotee, you can be separated from your spiritual master, but then by remembering them, you feel sweetness in that remembrance. Right? And uh, Prabhupada's godbrother pointed out the story of Ramchandra where Sita and Ram were separated. And it's kind of a tragic story, but there's a sweetness in it that you experience because it's a sweetness of love of Ram sacrificing everything to get Sita. So even though the separation, which is the pain, you feel the love of Lord Ram and the love of Sita for Lord Ram and the love of Lord Ram for Sita. You feel that through that separation. So there, it's it's spiced with the, the pain of the preparation is spiced with this sweet spice of love. So that's the idea. So, and then if you look at it from what we were just talking about, the more intense the separation, the more it's spiced with love, then the, the more the separation, the sweeter it gets because love is sweet. Right? Is that okay? Now, we were talking, I don't know if we were, I don't know if we were talking in class but we were talking, I was talking with some devotees about an interesting principle. If you know something, but you don't feel it, then you don't really get it. And certainly, if you don't feel it generally, most times, you won't act on it, because we tend to act on what we feel. So if I know that I'm great by knowledge, by I have degrees that says you're great, but I don't feel great, then I'll act like I feel, which is not so great. I'll act, maybe I'll act stupid because I feel stupid. I've done stupid things and it makes me feel stupid. But objectively, I'm not stupid. So sometimes we have that experience that we understand something, but we don't feel it. And so that's, that's I think for me at least, and I, probably for all of us, that's one of the ways it's most evident is in this discussion of separation. because. Prabhupada has talked about separation of the spiritual master and glorified it as, as even better, but nobody, you know, no one generally, I don't want to say nobody, but we don't generally feel that way. We feel very special in the presence of our spiritual master. We don't feel glorious in his absence as much as we feel glorious in his presence. And then Prabhupada's telling us all the glories of separation and how the spiritual master is physically is is present in his instruction, and that the instruction is higher than the physical presence. So as long as we only understand it, but we don't feel it, it doesn't really register, and we don't really believe it. And say, no, I don't, I don't feel like that. You ever say that? I understand, but I don't feel like that. So it's gonna, it takes experience, and it takes advancement to be able to feel that way. But someday we'll feel that way. And we just have to keep discussing this and understanding the theory behind it of the, the presence of the Guru in his words and instructions, even past Acharyas, and how we're, we're closely associated and guide, guided by them. Even not physical presence is there, but transcendental presence is there. Then gradually someday you come to the point where you feel that. 
and then when you feel it, everything, then there's there's no need. You will never doubt it again if you feel it. It's just the, it's the way you are. And you'll always feel the presence of your spiritual master in the separation of his service. And then also we have to be prepared for the separation because someday the spiritual master will depart and then we'll serve the rest of our life in separation. And so we really have to understand how to cultivate that relationship in separation to be able to do that, right? Otherwise, how could you do that? You would, you'd be devastated if you haven't cultivated some understanding that the spiritual master is present in separation through service and instruction then you'd be devastated when he leaves. And many devotees were devastated in Prabhupada's absence because they didn't, f they weren't fully realized in this area. Oh, well, not fully, but they didn't realize this sufficiently to be able to continue. So it's important. And then you want to continue the mission of the spiritual master after he departs with the same enthusiasm and dedication you had when he was present. And you, you want to realize that those instructions which he gave 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, are as alive and vital and relevant today as they were when he first gave them, as exemplified by Prabhupada, who 40-odd years later came to America, 42 or something. And the instructions were vital in Prabhupada's heart 42 years later. You know, you know, I often say, I don't know, maybe I haven't often said, but I think I've often said, I can't remember what I've often said anymore because it's just the way life is. But I think I've often said that what Prabhupada not only carried Srimad Bhagavatam to the West, he carried his spiritual master with him because if he didn't, how could he do what he did? So he really carried his spiritual master with him. Right? He, you know, he said, I always, you say, yes, he carried the order of the spiritual master. That's true. But that's the same as carrying the spiritual master, isn't it? The order and the spiritual master. So he carried the spiritual master with him. Wherever he went. So he was never separated. Isn't that interesting? You can carry the spiritual master with you. You don't even have to have a deity. You just carry the order. And when you, when you think of, well, why am I doing what I'm doing? Well, I'm doing what I'm doing because my spiritual master told me. Then, then naturally, that's how you feel his presence. When you're, you're somewhere in the world doing whatever you do, but you, you're not doing it because you want to do it. You're doing it because this is service to your spiritual master. Then how could you forget him? And how could you not feel his presence? Right? Naturally. Otherwise, you know, you, we don't, we shouldn't do things on our own account. So if we're doing things on the account of our spiritual master, then we're meditating on him. A lot of, a lot of times, my god brothers and I will discuss something. We're trying to understand what Prabhupada wanted. And trying to understand what he meant about something. So that's, we're very absorbed talking about Prabhupada, and that means we're very absorbed in associating with him, just by trying to understand his heart, his desire. Or I mentioned before, I think I mentioned before, that sometimes I'll have the opportunity to deal with some difficult situations in our movement, some problems, and it just makes me feel closer to Prabhupada in the struggles to resolve these issues because these issues are to make Prabhupada's movement stronger. And so in trying to make his movement stronger, obviously I'm serving him. It's obvious to me that's why I'm doing it, and therefore I feel close to Prabhupada. Very, sometimes, sometimes the worse it is, the closer I feel. Because it's, it's like, I feel like I'm, I'm trying to hold up a foundation that's cracking. And I'm holding it up for Prabhupada.
Have you had that experience before? Do you ever feel like that? Yeah. Do you ever feel like in difficulty you feel even closer? Well, the more responsibility you take, the more challenges often the closer you feel. Not that you have to have challenges and difficulties and, re- and big responsibility, but generally when you do, you feel closer to your spiritual master. <clears throat> because again, it's the same point. that There's so many things you would be doing that you would normally do. So you're ob- it's obvious that I'm not doing it on my account. I'm going to ask these devotees to quiet down a bit. Don't go anywhere. Hold on. I think they're trying to find where my suitcase is because I'm leaving tomorrow. I never lost a suitcase. When they said, take it off the plane, we'll put it underneath. I've done that a hundred times. And this was British Airways, so they're supposed to be British, but I guess not British enough. So hopefully we get it today because if we don't, then I need things in there. Okay, Sita Leela has a question. As a householder, one may not develop intense feelings with the spiritual master due to less time spent following his instructions as most of the time goes in what? Earning a living, yeah. Okay, but you're also doing that on the order of the spiritual master. <laughs> Depends how you're earning a living, right? And if you're earning an honest living and you're engaging that money in service, you should think I'm doing this on the order of my guru. Yeah, and if you're engaged more directly in service, it's easier to think that way, for sure. But you should think everything I'm doing, that's I'm just doing... In other words, if you're in the, if you're in the consciousness that I don't have a life independent of the order of the Vaishnavas and the guru and Prabhupada, then even though I'm working... I'm doing that according to some standard. Uh, I'm maintaining my family. It's my dharma. I do my sadhana in the morning. So this is, I do this all in the service of Krishna. On the order of my guru. It's not for my sense gratification. And that, that's how you remember. Because it's, you're not doing it for yourself. If you get on a plane and go to Disneyland, it's going to be harder to remember your guru at Disneyland. But remembering him at work? No, because you have to work. So it's not that your guru said, don't work. I don't want you to earn money. He never said that. You know, No, earn money honestly. That's the order. So you're doing that. So in some way, you can put that together and remember him. It's just when you're engaged in something that's completely personal. What do you want to do? Oh, I just want to go to a movie. Then how are you going to remember your guru at the movie? Unless it's something which relates to Krishna consciousness. Maybe the themes of the movie would remind you of the instructions of your guru. But if it's just purely for entertainment, you you understand. I think it's kind of obvious, isn't it? That when we're engaged in something that's just for ourself, it's harder to remember our guru because it's not... Sometimes you you might remember him in guilt. I shouldn't be doing this. He won't be happy. But generally when engaged in something which is very self-centered and not related to the service of Krishna, it's, you don't really think of your guru because it's, your guru, is, his relevance is within devotional service and particularly within his service directly and his relevance is gu- the guidance that he gives you. So like, let's say your husband's working but your spir- his spiritual master has given him guidance on how to deal with people. So at work he tries to deal with people that way. Then he'll remember 
the spiritual master because he'll be acting on that order. Does that make sense? Um, what... What compared to the announcement? I don't see what. Hmm. Oh yeah, when compared? Yeah. So if you see everything you're, if if everything you're doing is in service, even though it's not direct, you're not here. Your husband isn't distributing books. He's doing some. He's working for a company. Well, that's how he maintains himself, and he he's in the right consciousness. He's He's following the instructions of his spiritual master while he's at work. He's dealing with people properly. He's doing his dharma, following Krishna's instructions. So then he should be able to remember Krishna. It's just, as I said, it's just when you engage something solely for your own benefit that you you can't remember Krishna. That's the point. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, there's, there's you know, there's... This, there's this feeling that I can't remember Krishna unless I'm distributing books or preaching directly. But really, you should look at it as just there's different intensities of remembering Krishna and different ways it can be done. And I think sometimes we write off ways where we could be remembering Krishna just because we think that's not the right environment for remembering Krishna, so we forget him. It's like an assumption we make. Oh, I could never be Krishna conscious in this environment. So then, <laughs> as soon as you step in that environment, your Krishna consciousness is lost. And that does happen. But rather, if we connect that to the instructions of our Guru, then, then you can see how to relate it in a way you can be Krishna conscious. Whoops. You didn't want to look at my finger, did you? Well, you did. Mm -hmm. And it's funny, you know, because you you'd say, well, if if I were in the renounced order of life, then I would be more Krishna conscious. In theory, that would make sense because I could be more engaged in Krishna service. But you could be lazy also and distracted. You could end up playing computer games all day. You know, so it's not like that's necessarily ideal. I just gave a class about that. And, you know, what what we think is ideal is not always ideal. That's the point. You know, you think, oh, this, you know, ideal if I was renounced. I wouldn't have to work. I could think of Krishna. That so many renounced people gave up Krishna consciousness and so many people working are doing fine. So, you know, it's not just, it's not exactly what it seems externally. Yes, you know that, right? And that's an important point. I have a class I gave in Italy about this. It'll, when I get around to it, I'll edit it and put it online. You can hear it as it's a Bhagavatam class. <laughs> kind of elaborated on that point of, you know, our definition of what's ideal and what's not ideal. You know, quote unquote, ideal situation. But ideal situations have to be taken advantage of. And then situations which aren't ideal can, by a change of consciousness, can be ideal. Even bad situations can be ideal. If you, if you're in the right consciousness, because it it um, can inspire you in devotional service. The bad can be an inspiration because the bad comes from a lack of Krishna consciousness. So in the right consciousness, then even the bad becomes good. In the wrong consciousness, even the good becomes bad. You know, if you if you think, okay. What would be the ideal situation for me to be Krishna conscious? I'd say, well, ideally, if I could live in Vrindavan, that would be the best. And maybe Radha Kund. Radha Kund. But if you think about it, you understand if if you went to Radha Kund and you weren't in the right consciousness, it would probably be the worst place for you. 
And if you went to your job in the right consciousness, because you're a passionate person, you need to work and you need money, and that job would engage your nature, it was probably the best place for you. Do you agree? It's interesting, isn't it? If you're, if you're not qualified living in Radha Kun, you would fall into Maya. And if you have a certain nature where you you need to have a family, you need to work, all these things, then by doing that, you can become very satisfied and you can you stabilize your Krishna consciousness. So that was the idea of the class, that you know what you might call an ideal situation doesn't necessarily mean it's ideal. You know, even if you take, let's bring it back to the topic of love, even if you take a couple that's compatible, but you say, oh, I'm going to get married to so-and-so because we did the astrology and it says we're very compatible. Is that a guarantee that you're going to have a good marriage? Not necessarily. Or we're not so compatible. Is that a guarantee you'll have a bad marriage? Not necessarily. It depends on your consciousness. Right? So, everything depends on consciousness. Hmm. Any other questions? Otherwise, I'll read. I'll continue reading. Now we've already, we'll go over a few minutes because we started late. We've gone 46 minutes. Yes. I'll just wait a moment if there are other questions. And if not, I'll continue reading. If you're not on chat, you can get on chat somehow. There is a way to do it. I think you have to register with a password or create a password. Okay. Prabhupada says, without love of Godhead, there's no meaning even to direct contact. Listen to this. This is so interesting. <laughs> this is like such a paradox. Pay attention, students. During the presence of the Lord, there were thousands and thousands of men. But because they were not in love of Godhead, they could hardly realize the personality of Godhead Sri Krishna. Therefore, we must first activate our dormant love of Godhead by following the prescribed rules and by following in the footsteps of the authorities who are actually fixed in love of Godhead. Isn't that interesting? So the point is made here. What Prabhupada is saying here is if you don't love Krishna, even if you're in personal association with him, that there's no emotion. Nothing happens. Nothing goes on. So then, what's the point of meeting? Like you, you can see the deity, you can hear the Bhagavatam, you can chant the holy name, and you're meet, so you're meeting Krishna in these ways, but you don't realize that it's Krishna, and therefore nothing's going on. There's no emotion, there's no feeling, there's nothing. And you can be separated from Krishna. Uh, you know that story, the devotee was, he was reading Bhagavad Gita and he was crying and he was thinking, Krishna's so merciful, he's driving the chariot of Arjuna. And he couldn't read, he was illiterate. So he had the Bhagavad Gita in his hand, he couldn't even read it. And he's thinking about Krishna, driving the chariot and he's crying. So he's fully Krishna conscious. Can't even see the picture of Krishna. And someone else can see Krishna and not Krishna conscious, don't even, doesn't even realize it's Krishna because there's no love. You can't see God, and there's no meeting. You can't see him if you don't love him. Hmm. Mm. 
Uh, Chaitanya Charitamrita Madhyalila Prabhupada says, Vipralamba helps nourish emotions at the time of meeting. In other words, the Prabhupada saying in the in the world of love of Krishna, if you're separated, then when you meet, it's a greater greater feelings, greater intensity. And if you and if you study the literature of love a little bit, you'll see that one of the elements in relation with Krishna is always to do things that will increase the love and affection. That's so this is an example of that. It's saying separation helps nourish love. And so someone might say, well if you already love, why are you so obsessed in nourishing it? If it's already there, why not just enjoy it or give it? But that's the nature, the dynamic nature of transcendental rasa. You always want to do things to nourish the rasa. So separation increases the intensity of meeting. So that's why Radha and Radha Krishna Leela is always, he's always separated from somebody. When he's with the gopis, he's not with his mother. He's not with the coward boys. When he's coward boys, he's not with his mother and the gopis. When he's with the mother, he may not be with the gopis, he may not be with the coward boys. So... And Krishna's God, so he could, in effect, be with everybody all the time. He could build a big castle and everybody could live together. But he arranges that there'll be separation for a reason. Right? Because as said here, it intensifies the, the emotions of meeting. Highly advanced ecstasy is divided into two categories, madan and mohan. Meeting is madan and separation mohan. The last verse of, of Shishastakam represents both meeting and separation. Being experienced at any given time according to how spiritual emotions move in the waves of ecstasy. So for us, the main, the main idea here is that meeting and separation are different aspects of the same thing and their separation is nourishing to the meeting. Hmm. Coming back into reality of our attempt to appreciate such exalted heights, we can be amazed at how externally such separation seems to cause shock, agony, and devastation, when in fact such shocking, agonizing, and devastating is ecstatic bliss. So there's no misery in these spiritual emotions. The agony of separation is transcendental ecstasy. Since the words madan are used to in, indicate meeting and the word mohan for separation, we can justifiably match the words to Radha, madan, mohan, who Prabhupada called our attracting lordships. We pray to be attracted to them so they can attract us to the ocean of separation. So, why don't we end here and see if you have any questions. The Mary Son of England is trying to break through the window, but there's too many clouds. We had, uh, but we had some sun. We had Rathyatra the other day. We had some sun. Krishna's kind on me when I come here. He gives me sun. He knows how much I like sun. Okay. I'm waiting for you. I wouldn't be a good radio host. I have to elicit questions from you. Um, oh, I could continue reading if there's no questions. There's a few more things. Hmm. I don't know if I could read something like hmm, here's I told you this story before. I'll read it to you. Let's, I think I just told I might have told it in the last time we gave this course, but I'll read it to you. There may be some it may be more clear if I read it. 
Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur once surprised his audience by saying that neophyte devotees wish to live in Vrindavan, but a man of real bhajan, real divine aspiration, will aspire to live in Kurukshetra. He noted that Thakur Bhaktivinoda, after visiting many different places of pilgrimage, remarked, I would like to spend the last days of my life in Kurukshetra. And Kurukshetra is the place where Vipralamba is at its peak, while Vrindavan is the place of Samboga. Radharani feels the greatest separation here because Krishna is so close, but their Vrindavan Leela is impossible in Kurukshetra. Krishna is in Kurukshetra so near, but he is in the role of a king, and they cannot meet intimately. At that time, Radharani needs the highest service from her group of servitors. Bhaktivinoda Thakur says that in this heartbreaking situation, a drop of service will draw the greatest amount of prema, divine love. In other words, separation hit the pinnacle in Kurukshetra. And so that's, if we meditate on that, that will it will arouse our prema or at some point okay so now I see we've gone 58 minutes I think that's good the article is finished I've read what I wanted to so uh, thank you very much and I'll keep you posted about when the other classes will be I'm going back to America so some adjustment might be there okay Hare Krishna Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai Go Premanandi Hari Hari Bo